Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, the audience. Um, welcome to the eighth edition of the DI Inside lecture series. Well, this month, the DI Cairo department is in charge and will contribute with two lectures. The first of which will take pl place tonight already, and the second next week, Wednesday at 6 p.m. Uh, at the same time. I would like now to introduce the speakers of tonight's lecture, Dr. Daniela Rosenau and Mathieu Goetz. Daniela Rosenau studied Egyptology at the Humboldt University in uh, Berlin, where she wrote her PhD thesis on the Great Temple of Bastet in Bubastis. For the last 20 years, she has taken part in excavation projects in Egypt and was also trained in the application of archaeological science during postdoctoral Marie Curie Fellowship at the University College in London. She was specialized in the study of post pharaonic glass. Having spent, ex uh, having spent extended periods of re research with, within museum collections in the UK and USA, she worked <clears throat> as a curator at the British Museum and was there in charge for the exhibition, Sunken Cities, Egypt's Lost Worlds. Between 2017 and 2020, Daniela directed the German Archaeological Institute's excavation project at Dashur, exploring a newly discovered settlement of the early Old Kingdom, which will be the topic of tonight's lecture. Um, in, in 2021, Daniela has joined the Griffith Institute in Oxford, as a project officer and will assist in working on the Institute's uh, archival projects, such as the Griffith, Griffith, Griffith Archive. In addition, she will cura curate an upcoming public exhibition in Oxford, connected with the celebration of the 100th anniversary of the discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun, based on Howard Carter's excavation record. Mathieu Goetz, studied architecture in Kassel and Paris and worked as stage designer for many renowned theaters throughout Germany. Beside his creative occupation, Mathieu had several teaching assignments for classes on the history of architecture at Kassel University. At the moment, he studies Egyptology in Berlin and participates in several field projects in Egypt. One of them is Dashur, where he launched the project Dashur 4D project uh, with a research grant of the German Archaeological Institute. We will learn more about this very interesting project in the second part of the lecture. Um, now I would like to make a very last um, announcement to the audience before I hand over to the speakers. Um, you can um, add at any time, um, some questions uh, in the chat box on the bottom right. Uh, we will collect them during the lectures and pass them on to the speakers after the lecture, where we have time for discussion. Um, if you would like to uh, like to uh, your name be mentioned, simply sign the question in the chat with your name afterwards, because it's anonymous. Um, but now I would like to give the word to Daniela for the lecture with the title, Dashur, Recent Research in the Old Kingdom Settlement. Please, Daniela. Okay, so thanks, Martin. Um, now today will be a little bit of a double act. Now I will start with the third part, first part of the lecture talking about this recently discovered settlement in Dashur. And then this will be followed by a lecture by my colleague, Mathieu Goetz, who will talk about one of the many cemeteries we have in Dashur. Um, which was excavated in the early 2000s by us, but where we had in 2019 the opportunity to kind of re-examine it, this time using the latest technology, which wasn't available at the time of the initial excavation, and which literally pushes our research in Dashur in the fourth dimension. But let's start um, with um, a brief introduction, and I'm sharing my screen now. Do you all see everything? Okay, good. So um, Dashur is located about 30 kilometers south of Cairo on the western bank of the Nile, and it was founded as a royal necropolis by King Snofru, the father of Cheops. And during his reign, the two most iconic monuments of Dashur were erected, the Red Pyramid 
and the bent pyramid alongside various cemeteries for his family and his entourage. And after Snowfall's death, cult activities on his pyramid were carried out by priests throughout the whole of the Old Kingdom, so for more than 400 years. And these priests lived in the pyramid towns nearby at the edge of the cultivated land, and they were also buried in Dashur. During the Middle Kingdom, Dashur was once more used as a royal burial ground for several kings of the 12th and the 13th dynasty, as well again as um, their families and their court officials. So what you see here is the so-called Black Pyramid of Amenemhet III and its Pyramidion, which is in the Museum in Cairo today. And now there, although later on after the Middle Kingdom, Dashur had lost its status as a royal burial ground, um, private individuals were still buried in Dashur. So what you see here are two examples of burials um, <clears throat> from the late period cemetery and from the Greco-Roman necropolis. Um, the, the German Institute started working in Dashur in 1975. And during the last 10 years, we focused our work on exploring the structures associated with the complex of the Bent Pyramid, like the causeway, the Valley Temple, um, the harbor, the cult chapel of the Bent Pyramid, and the hope to learn a bit more about the evolution of um, pyramid building in ancient Egypt by putting the Bent Pyramid in its wider political, cultic, um, but also environmental context. So, and when we carried out a geophysical survey in 2012 in the area around the Valley Temple, it was a very pleasant surprise when we realized that there are actually huge buried structures just north of the Valley Temple, presumably a settlement covering an area of about 200 by 350 meters. And this is the settlement I'm going to talk about today. The initial work here <clears throat> was carried out by my colleague Felix Arnold in this area. And what he discovered was actually a garden and a cult building made of um, mud bricks in the southern part of the garden. And both structures were probably built around the 15th regnal year of Snofu. So they actually predate the Valley Temple, which is made of stone and which was probably built around the 30th regnal year of Snofu. That will be quite interesting later on in my talk. Um, when I began excavating in Dashun in 2018, I chose this area here to start our field work with the overarching aim to find out more about the nature of the settlement. So key questions were, who lived here, when, and why? And what we discovered were the remains of a very large house, house one in the following slides, um, covering an area of about 30 by 35 meters, so really impressive size for a building of this period. It lies only a few centimeters below the surface, is made of mud and sand bricks, and its walls are covered by mud plaster. And at least I think the inner walls of the rooms, so the ceiling, the, the rooms with the ceilings, were additionally covered by an extra layer of fine white lime plaster, which I think is quite well visible um, in the image here. So this is the plan of the house so far. And I think based on the layout and also the position of the plastered walls that are marked in red here, it's safe to say that the core living unit of the house was situated in the western part in an area that can be almost described a little bit as like a labyrinth, um, which perhaps included the residents' private apartments and the representative rooms. In the north, um, we have six silos and an open courtyard that was maybe used for grinding and for distributing the grain that was stored in the silos. While in the eastern part, we have several small rooms that might have functioned as kitchen wing, at least based on the existence of a rather thick layer of, of ash in some of these rooms. Um, so that's the layout of house one, already visible in the geomagnetic image um, was, well, it was very clear that um, east and south of the house, um, there were more buildings. So when we extended our excavations to the east, we revealed the remains of the western part of another house, house two, which is very similar to house one, in terms of its dimensions, of its layout, its building materials, but also its date. So I can already give it away. All the pottery we discovered in the two houses 
date exclusively to the early fourth dynasty, so the reign of Snefru. Um, the layouts of houses one and two were established by simply removing the covering layer, the top soil. And so at this point, we decided to properly excavate four of the rooms in house one in the, in the hope to find out more about the architectural organization, um, different construction phases of the house, but also to gain some insight into the functions of the rooms. And so we chose three rooms in the western part, rooms one, one, two, one, three, from east to west, and then in the north, the open courtyard, room one, four. Um, during the excavation of uh, the rooms in, in the western part of the house, we obviously discovered a large amount of um, the lime plaster fragments, and um, they were additionally also painted. So it became very clear that the walls of the rooms were originally painted in white. The lower part of the walls, the dado, was painted in black. But then we also discovered a large amount of these kind of molded plaster fragments, and they were covered, they were painted in red. So, and I think it's very clear based on the impressions you can see on the plaster fragments that they once covered the wooden beams of the ceilings of the rooms. Um, the floors of the three rooms are made of mud plaster. And what was a very pleasant surprise um, was that we discovered three column bases in room one, two. Um, they are made of limestone and surrounded by a layer of mud and circular shape. And I think given the trifoliate shape of the impressions uh, on the bases, it is very clear that these bases once carried uh, lotus-shaped columns. The columns itself were probably made of wood and are not preserved because most likely they were removed when the house was abandoned. So in order to verify whether the house was built in a different building uh, phases, we put sondages into rooms one, one and one, two, which revealed a second floor made of mud and lime plaster um, in room one, one, um, about 10 centimeters below the upper floor, a second floor came to light uh, made of mud and lime plaster, um, sh and showing a very large amount, about 200 of small, circular, slightly rectangular holes, some of them really deep, up to 20 centimeters deep, which might represent impressions of wooden stakes, maybe indicating some furnishing, or possibly hinting at certain uh, craft activities that took place in this room um, before its completion. And that you know, must have involved an installation that was has been clearly moved more than once. Um, the sondage in room one, two revealed even three different floor levels. The first two are more or less corresponding to uh, what we have in room one, one. Um, and then 13 centimeters below the second floor, a third floor came to light. And I think it's very clear that based on the stratigraphy and the architectural evidence, it must have belonged to an earlier construction phase of the house when the room actually not yet have either uh, the columns nor the corresponding uh, pilasters on the northern and the southern walls of the room. And finally, um, we also discovered an additional occupation layer about 30 centimeters below the third floor. Now what you see here are hand and footprints. So kind of ne, clearly indicating that certain um, activities must have taken place here before the house was built. And I think maybe it's not unlikely that it was actually here that the mud bricks were produced that were needed um, to build the cult building and the enclosure wall of the garden in the south. And that would, of course, give us a very good idea. If the garden was built around the 15th regnal year of Snefru, then that would mean that our house, or at least in its latest phases, probably dates to the second half of the reign of Snefru. In the northern part, we excavated four of the six silos and the southern part of the open courtyard, room 14. Um, and I think it's, it's good to see in the images, the silos were filled to the top of the remaining brick walls with a layer of wall collapse and rubble. And then below there is a layer filled with all possible kind of things, pottery, bone, charcoal, pottery, uh, wood. And the same also holds true for room one, four. So the red dotted line you can see here is actually the west eastern section through the room, kind of, and this all kind of clearly suggests that you know, when the house was abandoned, 
the silos and the courtyard were filled intentionally and at some later point the walls the superstructures of the silos collapsed supporting the idea again that the house was systematically abandoned um, the existence of the silos is also of course a good indicator that the house was used over a longer period of time there were clearly facilities um, that enabled the inhabitants to produce their own food and indeed many of the finds we've discovered so far are somehow connected to food production storage and consumption we have for instance several fragments of grinding stones there is a lot of charcoal animal bones and teeth and also flint tools including scrapers knives and sickle blades there's of course a huge amount of pottery um, and the majority of the assemblage consists of beer jars bread molds bread trays uh, storage jars but also finer mal and tableware now on the top right for instance you see a completely preserved really lovely bowl with a sprout and as i already said the whole pottery exclusively dates to the early fourth dynasty looking at the zoological remains um, bones and the teeth we discovered mainly belong to cattle followed by pigs and then uh, sheep and goats um, fish and bird are less common but what you see in the middle for instance is a bird's wing we discovered in situ there are also mollusks, no? um, mainly um, some fossils, also some freshwater mussels. But quite importantly, we also discovered several wet shells, which are seashells, um, clearly proving that our residents had somehow access to seafood, probably coming from the Mediterranean, which is quite remarkable because obviously you have to keep in mind that you had to transport um, these shells from the coast to the shore and you had to make sure they stay fresh because you didn't want to get a nasty food poisoning of course and uh, talking about seafood on the right you also see uh, some remains of cuttlefish although in that uh, case i'm not 100 percent sure if um, the cuttlefish was brought to the shore for consumption or mainly for commercial use of its cuttle bone which consists of very fine very pure lime and is therefore very often associated with technological processes. Um, to show you one of our more extravagant finds, we discovered this huge fossilized wing snail uh, from the Eocene period. It's 20 centimeters tall, very heavy. And I think it must have been understood as a very significant object at the time. It was found by someone, not necessarily near the shore. And then it was kept on purpose in the house. Um, and sure, our inhabitant was not the only fossil collector of ancient Egypt. Just to give you another example, what you see here is um, a fossilized sea urchin with a hieroglyphic inscription that tells us that it was found by the god's father, Chanetha. And as it was actually discovered in the temple of Heliopolis, uh, it's very clear that it was actually deposited there as an offering to the god at some point during the Ramesside period. So I would like to think that it was maybe our resident in Dashur who started this trend here. Um, but back to the animal remains intended for consumption. Now, the overall expression is that our resident's food to a large extent uh, consisted of cattle, pig, um, which of course allows some conclusions about their social position. There were clearly people with special privileges. And we have to assume that these people were provisioned by the residents and received very high quality food. Um, let's now have a look at the finds that are not related to food. Thanks to Dashur's uh, position at the edge of the desert, we have quite a large amount of botanic remains. There are several wooden objects like a tray or the mallet you see at the bottom left or a little spindle worm. Um, but there are also other botanical remains like fragments of ropes but also remains of matting. So I hope you can see it here. There are these remains of matting firmly stuck to the mud brick. Um, in terms of metal object on the left-hand side, they are all made of copper alloy. There are, for instance, several fishing hooks, but also some needles and an awl, which is a good indicator for the presence of women in the settlement. And we also have faience objects, a large amount of beads you see, you see on the right-hand side. They're originally belonging to some jewelry like collars or bracelets. But most importantly, 
we also have fragments of more than 100 faience tiles of various size, thickness, and shades of turquoise. Now, on the top left, you see two um, tiles who are larger in size and more or less correspond to the tiles we know from the underground galleries in the pyramid of Jossa, for which you see an example at the bottom. However, the vast majority of our faience tiles are much smaller and thinner. Uh, you see a collection on the right hand side, and I think they were used as inlays in wooden furniture. In terms of stone objects, apart from um, the currents and the silex tools I've already mentioned, at the top left, you see a hammer, which we discovered. Um, and then on the top and the bottom left, um, what you see there is a limestone furniture support in the shape of a, a truncated pyramid. And quite fittingly, next to it, we discovered some wood. Um, no, maybe parts of furniture like a chair or a bed, and then this furniture would have been placed on top of the stone uh, furniture support to protect the wood from termites and from moist. And on the right hand side, you see two drawings of um, two rim fragments of bowls made of a very special stone. It's made of an orthosite gneiss, which was actually quarried in Jebel Assa, so in the far south of Egypt. And these bowls belong to a type um, who are almost overwhelmingly um, found in early dynastic contexts. There were actually indeed only four, uh, six um, bowls known from the fourth dynasty, three of them handily uh, inscribed with the name of Snefu. So now we have altogether eight of these type of bowls, none from later periods, which I think fits very well with our pottery date. And to show you some of our more unusual finds, on the top left, you see the fragment of an ivory bracelet. In the middle is a small piece of malachite, which would have been used in the production of eye makeup. Um, at the bottom, you see a pendant that is made of the tooth of a wild boar. And most importantly, on the right, you see a clay seal impression you know, made with a cylinder seal which was uh, discovered in the open courtyard next to the silos. So maybe suggesting, supporting the idea that certain registration processes were taking place here. Um, the cylinders here was rolled over the clay several times, which makes it a bit difficult to read the inscription, but I think it's safe to say that we can definitely see the recurring sign of um, the scribe's outfit, the sesh sign, and the reed. So I think what we have here is an official seal that gives the title, sometimes the name of the seal bearer. So I think our seal once belonged to a scribe whose name included the letter I. Um, after having had a look at the architectural remains and the finds, maybe the most crucial question we have to ask ourselves here is of course, what, what kind of settlement do we have here? at the edge of the desert as part of a royal necropolis. Um, there are indeed different types of settlements known from the context of the old pyramids, um, of the old kingdom pyramids, and they roughly speaking fall into two different uh, categories. We have structures related to the building process of the pyramids, like workshops, construction sites, um, worker settlements. And then we have domestic structures related to the royal funerary cult, like priests' accommodations and the pyramid towns. So what do we already have in Dashur? We know, thanks to the decree of Pepi I, that actually two pyramid towns existed in Dashur. Um, and the drillings conducted by the German Institute in the early 2000s clearly proved um, the existence of the northern pyramid town on the edge of the flood plain, where indeed more than 100 years ago, the decree was discovered by Ludwig Borchardt. Um, we also have priest accommodations. Now they came to light inside and outside of the Valley Temple of the Bent Pyramid, dating from the early fourth dynasty to the Middle Kingdom. And we also have a construction site, so-called workman's barracks, where most likely the workman who built the pyramid rested, ate, spent some time during the day. And we have a workhouse southeast of the Red Pyramid where people work during the day. 
Um, still undetected is a worker settlement, no? so the place where the people who built the pyramid actually lived. So the question is, of course, could our houses one and two um, been have part of such a settlement? And indeed, many of the finds of our houses are very similar to artifacts that were discovered in com uh, comparable settlements. However, it is not entirely unproblematic to identify our houses as part of such a worker settlement, especially given its size and also uh, looking at the furnishing or the interior of our houses. Our building in the Shur are significantly larger than other houses we know from fourth dynasty settlements, for instance, um, in the so-called Western town and the settlement of Echet El Gurab in Giza are also um, the complex of Chenkaos in Giza or the houses we know from Elephantini Island during the fourth dynasty. The, these plans are all true to scale and talking about size. So not only are the individual houses larger than anywhere else, the settlement itself is also really huge compared to, for instance, what we have in Giza at the same time. And indeed, it is the same size as the inhabited part of Elephantini Island during the Old Kingdom. And looking at the interior, obviously, our inhabitants lived in a building with plastered and painted walls, some rooms with lotus columns. They ate cattle, pig, seafood. They owned wooden furniture with faience inlays, stone vessels made of a material buried 800 kilometers away, and they had ivory bracelets. So this does, of course, all not really fit into the picture of a typical worker settlement. And instead, I think it's very clear that our inhabitants belong to the upper class of the ancient Egyptian society. And given the preliminary date of the house, these people were probably involved in the building process of the pyramids in a leading logistical and administrative role. And as during the early fourth dynasty, the key roles um, were firmly in the hands of the principal members of the royal house, I think in all likelihood it might actually have been the son of Sneferu, who was in charge of putting this huge project into action and who might have lived in the settlement with his family and his household. Um, and I think one more very important factor to keep in mind when it comes to trying to understand the nature of the settlement it's, it's a position within the necropolis of Dashur. I hope you can see it well on the satellite image. Our settlement is strategically, it's more or less really situated at the fork between the, the bend and the red pyramid. So extremely well placed to control more or less everything that reached Dashur. Building material, livestock, food provisions, manpower. And at the same time, it was also very close to the valley temple of the Bent Pyramid, which was, of course, the main ceremonial cult place of the necropolis. So I think the infrastructure that was created here um, might have served as both, now, as a main ceremonial entrance to the necropolis and in a secular function, being the kind of main node of all administrative and logistic operations that were required to build the two pyramids. Um, and with this, my talk more or less comes to an end. Now, on a final note, obviously, we have so far only revealed a tiny fraction of the large building ensemble that is visible on the geomagnetic map. <clears throat> so now everything I've told you today is only preliminary and has, must be treated with a certain caution. Um, now it's clear that the work there needs to be continued in order to be able to say more about maybe the architectural organization of the house or the general purpose of the houses and indeed the entire settlement. So I hope this will be possible in the future and that I can report back to you in due course. And so this is the end of my lecture and I hand over to you, Mathieu. Thank you, Daniela. For the second half of this talk, you will stay at Ashur and have a closer look at another structure there, but mostly at some considerations on how to adequately present archaeological data, specifically archaeological reconstructions. The Dam 8 cemetery is located in the Wadi east of the Red Pyramid, about a kilometer northeast of the area presented in the first half of this talk. 
Some eight standing for the sure middle central area. Location number eight is a large arrangement of group masters, some with adjacent culture posts and surrounded by simpler individual tombs. The cemetery was first mentioned following a survey executed by the German Archaeological Institute in 1997. In 2002 and the following years, this year, this area was then excavated under the direction of Nicole Alexanian. In 2019, I had the opportunity to join the team that was to excavate the Dam 8 Mastabas anew. They had meanwhile been covered for conservation. The aim of the excavation was to create a three-dimensional model of the Mastabas by techniques which were, at the time of the first excavation, not so easily available and applicable. I'll come to that later. The blank area inside the red circle of the slide corresponds roughly to the excavated area. Geomagnetic prospections done parallelly to the excavation work revealed that the cleared area represents only a very small part of this large cemetery. The Matbrook Mastavas are overall well preserved, partly still standing almost up to two meters high, and limestone plastering is preserved on some of their walls. No, where's my slide? Yeah. The cemetery has a very dense, almost settlement-like structure of architectural features and access corridors. The individual mastabas, most of them being of rectangular shape, are not isolated, but connected by shared walls. This and their relative position to each other on shifted axes results in a maze-like arrangement of the corridors with exactly defined ways of approaching the cult niches. Oop. The cult niches located on the east side of each mastaba, the side facing the Nile Valley and the nearby town. Some, though not all of the bigger mastabas, have a more complex chapel architecture in the southeast corner. The rectangular shape is defined by thick mud brick outer walls, enclosing between four and 11 shafts, the remaining space being filled with rubble, mainly coming from the material dug out for the shafts. The burial shafts are up to 10 meters deep, having at the bottom a sealed of burial chamber. The main and more elaborate burials of the mastabas usually were the ones lining the south side of each mastaba. Although most of the burials were disturbed, some were found undisturbed. Even, the undisturbed burials, only even in the undisturbed burials, only very few to no burial goods were found, the dead being sometimes buried in wooden coffins, as in the picture on the left, where the coffin and the bones were almost completely decayed due to ground humidity, or like in the middle picture, placed in a wooden box secondarily used as a coffin in a shaft that was not as deep and thus less humid, resulting in better conservation. The simpler tombs and those in the vicinity of the mastabas consisted of even simpler burials. The most common burial good was pottery. I'm waiting for the slide. It somehow takes some time to respond. Ah, there. Like miniature, ves miniature vessels, ensuring the provision of the dead in symbolic ways, functional beer jars and beer jar shirts, or libation, vessel, libation vessels for water offerings, documenting rituals at different stages during and after the burial process, below and above ground. Now, who were the people buried at them eight? The pottery indicates that the excavated area was used as a cemetery between the Old Kingdom's fourth and sixth dynasties most indisturbed burials dating to the fifth dynasty. It was the burial place for the inhabitants of the nearby Northern Pyramid town of King Senefu, east of the cemetery. Those inhabitants ensured the cult at the Red Pyramid complex, west of the cemetery, in the centuries following Senefu's death around 2620 BC. Thus, the population consisted in a big part of priests and their families, as well as their household members, or as Nicole Alexanian put it, members of the middle class of the royal residence, equipped with certain privileges. Although I'd love to go on talking about the many interesting special features of the Mastabas architecture, like the different executions of the cult places or the diverse miniature Mastabas, the main focus of this talk will be something else. As I mentioned earlier, the aim of the latest excavation at Dam 8 was a 3D documentation of the Mastabas. The technique chosen for this is structure for motion as it can be achieved with affordable software and does not require special equipment other than a good camera. Just very quickly, the principle behind SFM is to combine multiple 2D pictures with different viewpoints into one 3D model in a way similar to the two eyes of a person merging two images in a depth, into a depth perception by combining the different angles which the same point in space is viewed by either of the eyes. 
On this slide, we can see Chris taking pictures of one of the mustabas. He would be standing there and take several pictures from this spot and then move a step to the side and repeat the procedure until the whole mustaba is covered from all sides by pictures slightly overlapping in depth and width. Those pictures are then merged into a 3D model. The advantage of photogrammetric 3D models is obvious. Though they will never replace traditional means of representation, such as ground plans, sections, elevations, alongside with those, they offer a more complete understanding of an archaeological structure. Photogrammetic 3D models also provide users untrained in the reading of architectural or archaeological representational conventions with a more intuitive access to understanding the geometry of structures. But of course, representing the status quo of archaeological sites or its state at any moment of the course of the excavation is only one part of what, archaeologic, well, of what archaeologists must do in order to understand and communicate the past, another part being to explore and communicate what the site might have looked like in the past. We are all accustomed to images like this one. Based on archaeological finds, archaeologists, sometimes together with artists, speculate on how the site might have looked like and produce drawing rendering those speculations. However, there are issues. What a viewer remembers after seeing such reconstructions is not the amount of speculation or the fact that it is speculation, but the reconstruction taken as reality. Or, as James Simon put it, the only certain thing about any reconstruction drawing is that it is wrong. The only real question is, how wrong is it? Usually, it is impossible for a person not knowing the presented building very well, what is based on archaeological evidence and what on subjectivity. The question thus resulting is, should speculation be represented inside the frame of archaeological reconstructions, and if so, how? There are other issues related to the way what archaeological reconstructions are meant to represent and how they are perceived. Just briefly mentioned, reconstructions often show an idealized state that, although it never existed in the biography of the building, is communicated as the one correct state of the building. The individual pictures show one moment frozen in time. Unless it is not presented with other pictures explaining the development, they can't explain the history of a site. On the other side, this one moment depicted is often depicted without the people using the building, rendering the building as an abstract, lifeless um, sculpture. And to mention just one more issue, reconstructions often show the building in an isolated way, neglecting, neglecting settings and context, vital parts of any building, and thus an important key to their understanding, are not visible. The identification of those problems is nothing new. Better approaches have been postulated in the London Charter or in the civil principles, but they only slowly find their ways into archaeological documentations and communications. My Egyptology bachelor thesis being the architecture of the Dam Eight Mastabas, Dam Eight Mastabas, and me spending a lot of time on thinking how to represent them, I of course came along those questions, and so I welcomed the opportunity offered by the DAI Cairo to develop a small project addressing those questions and a couple of other questions. The Italian historian, historian of architecture, Bruno Sevi, wrote that no means of architectural representation, not even film, can substitute for the real life experience of meandering through a building. I totally agree with him, but I want to add that we now have access to means of representation that come quite close and that offer some advantages a physical walkthrough can't provide us with. Those means being immersive virtual reality. So I set up a few parameters for my project. The starting point being to find a way to adequately represent a reconstruction as hypothesis. This means that the basis of the reconstruction has to be communicated transparently and the amount of speculation perceivable. It also means that the reconstruction must be seen as an intermediate step in a discussion, a proposition triggering answers, comments, corrections, alternative views, just as a written scientific article does. This again means that the reconstructions must be updatable and expandable upon new findings and expanding knowledge of the site and topic. I wanted the reconstruction to be easily accessible, not only to the scientific community, but to everyone interested. This meaning two things. I need to find ways of representing that are easy and intuitively to understand, as well as being at the same time scientifically valid. And it also means that the access has to be as barrier-free and low threshold as possible. 
scientific robustness and longevity demands for ways of processing data in resilient, sustainable, and easily expandable ways. The reconstructions themselves must display speculation as such, um, allow to display change over time, allow for the display of irregularities and non-perfect states, and display the use of the building and its context. I apologize for the horrible slides. It will be the only one like this. I looked for projects with similar aspects or approaches. One thing that particularly struck me is that when having a closer look at similar projects, only one provided information in Arabic, although all of them are dealing with cultural heritage in Egypt. Both accessibility was clearly not the goal addressed in a convincing way. I do believe in the power of small teams. Of course, this means we aren't very fast, but we can be very flexible and really discuss things through. And I can assure you, there's a lot of discussion going on in this team, as we all three have a very different background. Lothar, as an experienced graphic designer with a focus on clear communication, contributes with his deep understanding on how to best transmit content. Baker, with his background as digital artist and game designer, sees the project not as something static, but as an experience. Let me share some images of our vision of the project. Please understand that the following images are placeholders for ideas and concepts, not the actual project. Easy accessibility means that we have to keep in mind all kinds of devices. This resulted in the decision not to develop an app demanding um, high, um, high maintenance and updates and depending on platforms or stores, but to develop a website responding to the device the user has at or in his hands. Is it just someone being curious? Is it a student of Egyptology or is it a fellow scientist accessing the data? The different audiences require different experiences as modes and modes of presentation of the data. The data, of course, has also to be embedded in the data architecture of the DIA. Let us imagine a user having VR lenses available. Our prototype user here, in this case, it's me with a lockdown hairdo, will be able to choose between different modes of experiencing. From there, he will enter the site dive into a location, and if he wishes so, access um, additional information. And I want to hint at the timeline here at the bottom of the slide. There will also be a ways of providing, um, of observing the changes over time of this location. To enable both accessibility, this would be equally possible on devices with a 2D screen. That would be the core functionalities of our vision, expandable in different ways. I'm a big fan of what Germans call Baukasten Prinzip, literally construction kit philosophy, meaning you start modest, but from the beginning you allow for a modular expandability. One thing I love about Dashur is the immense diversity of its structures. So one way of expanding the project, one way of expanding the project would be to step to step by step add further sites into the experience allowing the user to discover different areas. Another way of expanding it would be to think of further uses. One option would be to implement the 3D model onto the site as augmented reality application, meaning to overlay what visitors actually see with digital information as part of the site management, something not existing yet in Egypt, as far as I know, despite the huge potential. We started by carrying together all available data resulting from the excavations and overlaying it. Luckily, the existing drawings and the photogrammetric 3D models are of an overall excellent quality. However, there are small differences between them. We thus go through every significant point of the structure, checking and collecting its coordinates and documenting those decisions. And that wouldn't be possible if we had only one or the other available. At this detail might demonstrate, we, with only, only with the 3D model, it was possible to really understand this, um, this exact corner of, the, of one of the mastabas. Or with this example here in the drawing, we have some bricks indicated, but only with overlaying it with a 3D model, we were actually able to see that there's another niche um, in this corner of the building. So the next step was uh, Baker building a first approximate 3D model and overlaying it again and again with the existing material and those approaching the shapes and developing some first very rough preliminary renderings. This is at one 
as one familiar with the, this kind of architecture or with the site will see on the first um, on the first side not the thing yet so um this is the state i showed to some of you in my last presentation a couple of weeks ago and from that moment on Vika and i were spending a lot of time together going again through each of the points checking again the um, models and the drawings and developing um a 3D model that can be used as a basis from everything going on from now. So this is the actual state of the modeling you can see on this picture now. The next step will be now to work on the appearance of the of the renderings, developing different looks for the for the stack, uh, textures and materials, and this meaning having to take um, different choices like how realistic does it have to be, how abstract can it be, how seemingly precise or how open to interpretation to the viewer um, will the materials be displayed. This will then be com combined with a color range, something we are already just have been starting to work on. Um, a matter of big debates in the team at the moment is what I mentioned as the starting point for this project. The question is how to display the amount of speculation. For this, we have been working with a corner of the Mastaba where archaeological data is not 100% clear. Bricks are missing, but we suppose the corner was closed. We could indicate this as speculation by highlighting the area, by working with transparency, or we could even work, again, my slides going ahead, um, or we could even work with gradients indicating the amount of probability. In this case, of course, it doesn't really make sense because this point is not much less probable than this one. But for the sake of demonstration, I wanted to show this possibility. And as we are in an immersive environment, we could even go for moving images. Each of these ways of uh, displaying speculation has advantages and disadvantages. Um, we are still working on this. We are still checking the options and we will still explore further. Like we haven't worked with texture yet. We haven't worked with saturation yet or with who, which would also be possibilities of displaying um, speculations. So this is this is an ongoing process still. Um, another further step will be to to think on about how to display the subterranean areas of the master bus, the shafts. How do you show something that is underneath? Um, that would be meaning working with also again with transparency or with X-ray mode, things like that. So that's another thing we are working on. And after this, very tough one will be oops, sorry, will be to display. One thing I was mentioning before, how the buildings were actually used, how were people interacting with those buildings and structures and how to fill this with life. So that will be a tough one. And yeah, that's the state of the project at the moment. And I would like to thank my team, of course, and, and Lea and, and Chris for providing me some of the material and Yuri for helping me some technical issues and handing back to Daniela with this picture. This, yeah, this is a, a picture I wanted to show as the last slide. Just you know, to thank, of course, the Ministry of Antiquities, um, our colleagues in the Dashur Inspectorate in the magazine. Um, obviously, everything is funded by the German Foreign Office. And I would also very like to thank my team um, in Dashur. What you see is actually only half of our team. The picture was taken on one of the last days. Um, yeah, so and that is officially the end of our lecture. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Daniela. Thank you, Mathieu, for this exciting lecture, giving this um, insight to your work of the archaeology and also the possibilities of uh, architectural reconstruction uh, and the concepts behind that, uh, which are um, in the same way important when dealing with architectural reconstructions as uh, when dealing with the excavations of such structures. I just wanted to point to that we have next week already um, on Wednesday, the 26th of May, again at uh, 6 p.m., the second talk uh, from the Cairo department in the AA Insight lecture series. It will be um, Johanna Siegel, and her team um, from the Realities of Life project talking about the topic a family dinner feeding the inhabitants 
of the Middle Kingdom House on Elephantini Island. So you can uh, register already at the end of the live stream here or on our homepage or on our Facebook page. Uh, there you can get access to the registration for next week's talk. Then I would like to say thank you again for Daniela and uh, Mathieu for this um, excellent lecture. And I'm wishing all of you a very nice and pleasant evening and hope to see you next week again back here, uh, Wednesday, 6 p.m. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.